Good morning to everybody on Zoom. Glad you're with us here. I'll give you a little testimony. We were with my daughter uh, Monday and, and came back on, on Tuesday. She said, Dad, are you going to do a special Christmas thing? I said, I don't know. You know, and I got to thinking about it. And uh, Christmas message, because they do that in her the church that she goes to and, and works at. But I thought what I'd do is uh, take you to Luke chapter 2. And I have some notes here on Luke chapter number two, okay? And that, I want to just go through the notes. So if you have any questions as, as I go through, uh, you just stop me and uh, ask the question, and we'll see what we can do about that and repeat it for the folks on Zoom, all right? So uh, let's do this. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll get going here with these notes from, and thoughts from Luke chapter two. Father... Uh, we do thank you for your kindness and goodness, your graciousness to us that comes to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Father, as we uh, look here at chapter 2 in Luke, I pray you'd, you'd bless it to our hearts. Might your spirit move in our, our hearts and minds and give us understanding of what it must have been like for uh, Mary and Joseph to experience what they experienced uh, in bringing forth our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for that in Christ's name and amen. All right, let me read the first five verses, and that's how we'll start out here. Luke chapter number two, verse one. Now in those days, a decree went out from uh, Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabitants. Now, does your Bible say earth or land? What's your Bible say? Verse number one. What? World, okay. It, it should say correctly the Roman Empire, because that, that was the world back then, all right? Verse 2, this was for the first census taken while Cornelius was governor of Syria. And, and that's added to give you a time frame. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child, okay, and was with child. Now, in verse number three, it says they each went to their own what? Okay, uh, and everyone on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Okay, city or town. Now, in verse 4, we found out Joseph's town. Okay, and he went from Nazareth there in verse number uh, 4 down to Bethlehem. Right now, Nazareth means branch. You know, branch like a tree, something that branches out. And you, you can get that from Isaiah 11, 11, 1. But they're going down to Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem is the city of David. And literally, Bethlehem means the town or city of bread. It's something that feeds somebody. Now, I'm going to say this to you. Bethlehem was not a large place. All right? Might have been the quarter of the size of Brockport. All right? Not a large place at all. But a city of David... Now, Bethlehem was about 65 miles from Nazareth. So I wonder how long it would have taken Mary and Joseph, especially in her condition. I mean, she's in her ninth month here to, to take this trip. You know, we, we watch the nativity movie every year. <laughs> okay. And, and, and she rides on the donkey. And then, then, then when she's crossing the, whatever river that is, they, they go across and the snake comes and scares the donkey. She ends up in the water. You know, I, I think about those things and, and, and uh, how much of a trip it should have been for her. Now, here's something that's interesting about Bethlehem. Okay. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's B-Y-T, Lehem. All right. It, it, the spelling, if you did it literally, word for word. So the Hebrew word Lechem, that's the end of Bethlehem, okay, uh, is a homonym for fighter or warrior. And who was David? He was a warrior. 
He was the greatest warrior that Israel ever had, okay, and, and fighter. And so Jesus then was born in the house of a fighter, as you look at this. I mean, you just you take these little nuggets you get as, as you go through these things, all right? And, uh, come back to me, uh, with me, please, to uh, Micah in chapter 5, all right? Micah chapter 5. Uh, let's see. Where am I going here? Micah, here we are, right after Jonah. Okay, and let's notice chapter, chapter number five, please. And verse one says, are you all there? You find it? Okay. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughters of troops, daughter of troop. They have laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. Now, did you notice that? Too little to be among the clans. It was a tiny, tiny village, if you want to say that, okay? From you, one, capitalized in my Bible, will go forth for me to be ruler of Israel. All right? To be ruler of Israel. So, when, when you see this, all right, and, and think about this. Now, here's something to think about. <clears throat> Mary was from chapter one that we've been looking at on Wednesday, Wednesdays, all right? Mary had a visitation from the angel Gabriel and told her she was going to have a child and told her who the child was going to be, all right? Going to be the Messiah, okay? the ruler, et cetera, et cetera. And think about Mary now. She came from the little town of Nazareth there not wealthy parents at all. That's a regular family, if you please. She's uh, given in marriage to Joseph. Now, most folks think Joseph was around 30 years of age, mature enough to handle a, a marriage and a family situation in the uh, Hebrew you know, society. And Mary was somewhere between 15 and 19, probably. Probably closer to 15 years old, okay, as you see this. And as you, as you look at this, and as you see this couple coming through, Joseph had a vision. Don't be afraid. Take Mary to be your wife. For that which is in her is from whom? From God. Okay? From God, as you see this. And then it goes on to say, and you, sh you shall name him Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, when you read that, you, you, think, you think about things, all right? At least I, I think about things. God hadn't been in Israel in terms of the temple since 586 B.C. That's when the Nebuchadnezzar came down the third time, and they totally destroyed the temple, wiped it out. And then when Zerubbabel came back down under Cyrus, you know, then you have Ezra and Nehemiah, the, the whole story there. Uh, and they rebuilt the temple. It, it was just a shadow, actually, of, of the first one. It wasn't as pretty and, and, and that sort of thing, okay, as you see that. But here you, have, here you have Mary and Joseph coming down to Bethlehem, all right? Then eventually they're going to go up, if we have time, we'll, we'll get to that, into Jerusalem to the temple, and it's going to be God's first visit to the temple since 586 B.C. And folks don't think of that very often. All right? But it's going to be the first one. Now, I was just listening to a gentleman, come, I, I don't know what church he was, uh, coming in. <laughs> and, and he brought up a, a couple good points. Who had the harder job? Mary or Joseph? And, and he had the, the people raise their hands, if you think Mary, raise, if you think Joseph. And, of course, he, he was taking a survey, you know, and he, he was laughing about it. Because we'd all say, well, Mary had the hardest job because she experienced in the flesh what God had told her in the spirit. All right? So she actually was living that. And she had the baby, as the angel told her she would. But then you have Joseph, who didn't have that experience. 
And how is he living in relationship to Mary and God? Totally by faith. I think Joseph had the harder part when it, when it came to this. All right? Because let, let's face it, once uh, the child is born, Jesus, and, you know, from 12 years old to he's 30, we, we have nothing there. But think of uh, uh, the uh, Pharisees or whoever it was, scribes, that said, we be not born of fornication. See? And so I wonder how, how often that Mary went through that. People thinking that she, you know, her first son wasn't Joseph's uh, uh, child, you know. And as you think of those things, as you're reading through, I mean, it's just, you know, we get it black and white on the words. And so we believe it by faith, like Joseph had to, uh, what happened there, you know. So it's, it's not always easy is what I'm, I'm trying to say there. Okay. So when I come back to verse four again, Joseph also went up from Galilee. Now, there's a number of things we can see there. David or Joseph was the house of David, right? The house of David. Now, how do we know that? How did Luke know that? Well, let's do this. Come back to Matthew with me. He knew it because of genealogy. All right. Come back to uh, Matthew chapter number one. And let's notice some things here. Please. Okay. Matthew chapter number one, we have the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. Let me just read the first couple of verses here. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Now, the actual nation of Israel actually begins with Jacob. He's the one that has the 12 sons. The promise is given to Abraham to have a son who is Isaac, who brings forth, you know, uh, uh, Jacob there, as you see that. All right. So as we look at this, the genealogy begins with Abraham. All right. With Abraham. And uh, but it tells us that the Messiah was the son of David. Joseph was of the house of whom? David. Okay. Now, come on down to verse number uh, five, please. Solomon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba who had been the wife of Uriah. We all know that story, right? But here, within the genealogy, you have a number of ladies mentioned, okay? Which, which to me is, is, is interesting if, if, if you're doing a study of that. But the, this points out to us that what? That Joseph came from the family of David, all right? David. And of course, David was going to be who? He was going to be you know, the, the God's promise to him, the Vedic promise, was that a son would sit on that throne, okay, for the life of Israel as you go through there. So Joseph is part of that, all right? Joseph was part of that. So the note or the question that I always ask is this, could or did Joseph have a right to be the king of Israel? He's from the family, family line, the promise that God made. Susan's going, no. Okay, and, and we'll agree with her at that. So uh, notice verse 11. You're still in Matthew 1? Let's read verse 11. Josiah, who was one of the greatest kings in the history of Israel, by the way, became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deport, uh, deportation to Babylon. Right now, Josiah died before this, but his sons were part of the deportation. Now, watch what happens when we come back to Jeremiah, please, in chapter 22. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 22. And let's pick it up. And actually, I'd like to read the whole thing, but we can't, don't have time for that. My Bible has at the beginning of the chapter, warning of Jerusalem's fall. All right, the fall. In other words, Babylon's coming down and 
Jerusalem's going to fall. And then beginning in verse 13, it says, messages about the kings. So we're going to look at the messages about the kings here. And let's pick it up in verse number 24, please. Verse number 24, where it says this. As I live, declares the Lord. Now, who's making the declaration here? The Lord is. Even though Coniah, okay, uh, hold on, who is Jeconiah, by the way, another name. Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pull you off. Picture it. Right hand, a signet ring. You know, the king's worship. God would pull it off. So he won't be king anymore. All right. And I will give you over into the hand of those who are seeking your life. Yes, into the hand of those whom you dread. Even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. So that's God's giving them over to them. I will hurl you and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born. And there you will die. But as for the land to which they desire to return, they will not return to it. Now, this is interesting because history tells us that when Israel went up, Judah went up because Assyria had already taken the, uh, the ten tribes away a couple hundred years prior to this. Uh, when Israel was taken up, certain of the people were left in, in the land by the Babylonians so they could still do the farming and all that kind of stuff. But when it came time to return, not that many people came back in terms of percentages of who went. They went up there. How long were there? 70 years. And what did they do up there? They have families. They established themselves, got businesses, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So watch what it says in verse 28. Is this man, Kaniah, a despised, shattered jar? Or, he is, or is he a ves uh, an undesirable vessel? Why have he and his descendants been hurled out and cast into a land that they had not known? In other words, why were they taken captive? O oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, write this man down childless. Write him down as childless. He had children. But God says, you write him down as if he had none. Okay, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. So what do we know here? As you read that, no descendant of his was going to sit. But then that brings us to a problem. Because God made David a promise. <laughs> All right, which we perceive to come in the person of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what, what is the deal? Well, let's, let's look at this. Uh, by the way, people call Matthew 1, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the royal line of Jesus. Okay, that brought him in. Now, let's come over, if you would, to Luke chapter 3. And lo and behold, in Luke chapter 3, we find another genealogy, okay? Another genealogy. And where am I? Here we go. Beginning there in verse 23. So, now we know that this now is what's called the legal line. So this is the line that's going to take you from David to the throne Skipping Coniah, whose descendants have no right to the throne. So I wonder who this person is as we look at it. All right. So let's, let's pick it up in verse 23 and read on down. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as it was supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. Now, what you have here is this. This line goes backwards. It starts with Jesus and goes backwards. And it's going to go all the way down to, in verse 38, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So it's going to go all the way back down to Adam, who's the son of God. Okay, are you all there? 
as, as you look at this. So it's kind of interesting. So we could read all the way down, but come on down to verse 31. The son of Mele, the son of Mene, the son of Matath, and the son of Nathan, the son of David. Now, in Matthew genealogy, Solomon is listed as the son of David by Bathsheba, all right, who was the wife of Uriah. Then Uriah was killed and David married her, okay? But Nathan is also the son of David by Bathsheba. So Solomon and Nathan had the same mother. Solomon ended up being the king because he was the one chosen. You don't hear about Nathan, okay? But what we know is this, okay, is that Mary comes from Nathan's line from David. So if you picture it like this, uh, here's uh, David uh, Solomon up here. Here's Nathan down here, and the line comes together like this. One was the royal line where all the kings were. So you got the Kaniah, okay, who God cuts off, and he, write him childless. They're not going to sit, okay? But then on Nathan's side, here comes Mary. Now think about it. And who is Jesus' father? It's God. So it's through Mary that the right of Jesus to sit on the throne comes. All right? If you, if you look at it that way. You know, draw a little chart and, and you can see it. So to me, it's, it's all very interesting. Okay? All very interesting as, as you look at that. So Joseph had no right to be the king, but yet his son his foster son. And by the way, according to Jewish law, Joseph was Jesus' father, legally, see, legally. He couldn't put him out on a street corner and leave him there for somebody to take. No, the law would have got, got him for that. So legally, he was, as, as we say that, okay? And, and Yes, ma'am. Come closer, come closer. Okay. Yeah, then a natural born son. Yeah. All right. Miss uh, Susan, just for the Zoom folks here, uh, mentioned she wrote a, read an article that said that Joseph adopts Jesus. So then Jesus has more rights as an adopted son than a natural born son. And that was... That's how things worked back then. And I think it's probably still that way today, all right, as you, as you look at it. Now, <laughs> where are we here? Oh, back to Luke chapter number two, all right? Luke chapter number two. Now, <clears throat> all right, where do I want to be here? Luke two. Let me get to the right, right place here, all right? So Luke two, so... Uh, where are we? Okay, so verse 5, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him, and was with child, all right, with child. Now, here's what happens. We come to verse 6 and 7. While they were there, where's there? There is Bethlehem, the small community there. The days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. Now, what does that tell you? What's that? Okay. <laughs> if it's her firstborn, that means there's going to be more. See, see what I mean? All right. Uh, yeah, keep, keep your hand here. You folks went the other way with it. <laughs> uh, come over to Mark with me in chapter number six. All right, Mark chapter number six. And right at the beginning of the chapter, verses 2 and 3, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in a synagogue. This is Jesus. And the many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is 
not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simeon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So here he has five or four brothers and sisters. That's at least two, right? As you see, could have been, could have been more. So he came from a healthy family as we see this. Okay, so she gave birth, we're back to uh, Luke chapter 2, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, I think I've mentioned this in the last couple of weeks somewhere uh, that I read this. Um, wrapping him uh, in cloth, okay, and placing him into a manger is what happened with the, the uh, lamb on the Day of Atonement with the high priest. They had to watch that lamb. He had to be examined for a period of time, all right, so that he was perfect, as, as they say. And then that morning, the high priest would wrap him and put him in the manger, a concrete manger, and that's, this was probably a stone manger, okay, uh, in, in, in Bethlehem there, that he was placed. So you can see him as a, a type, you know, uh, uh, the lamb is a type, and of course Christ is called uh, the lamb of God, right? It takes away the sins of the world. But no room for them where? In the inn. Now, here's the thoughts on this as, as, as we look at this. <clears throat> no room in the inn. The thought that I always have is that this took place during the Feast of Tabernacles. It's in the fall. It's late September, early October, depending on, on, on the date. The last seven, eight days, this feast does. So Jerusalem goes from 100,000 people to 250,000 people. Bethlehem is about five miles from Jerusalem. People are looking for places to stay. Mary and Joseph didn't make reservations. <laughs> So they didn't get there in time, all right? Didn't, didn't get there in time. So, so, and here's another thought for you. Why did Joseph go down to Galilee? Uh, down to uh, Bethlehem, rather. Okay, the census. He had to go down for the census because he was a family of David. I wonder how many of David's, or uh, Joseph's, families lived in Nazareth. Why would he be in Nazareth? I think maybe his grandfather, his father moved up there, started a business, a carpenter business or whatever. And I can visualize Mary and Joseph not coming down to Bethlehem by themselves, rather with family. All right. And what happens when they get to Bethlehem? More family. Yeah, it does. Yeah, just them. So, uh, but when they get down there, perhaps there was relatives. Now, as I understand this in, 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 in my reading, all right, the Greek word we call it an inn, it says inn. There was no room in the inn. There were no inns in Bethlehem. It was a tiny little community, okay? Uh, Cataluma, K-A-T-A-L-U-M-A. -A -A, okay, you can look that up in your concordance if you want, okay? Was not an inn but simply the upstairs level where guests could stay. And where Mary and Joseph was, and I don't know if you'll remember this, but Brother Bill was with us a number of years ago. I don't know how long it was. And, and part of his message was he, he shared that there, there was a, the main floor on, in their living spaces was like this stage, probably a bit bigger, all right? Then it dropped off just a foot or two, and that's where the animals stayed at night. Okay? That's where they stayed at night. So that's where Mary and Joseph were. They were on this stage, okay, that part of the house, which was used for business by people. Uh, if a woman, you know, weaved and did things, a guy was a carpenter, that's where they do it, right there, downstairs, and they lived upstairs, okay? So upstairs, there was no room in any of the homes for Mary and Joseph. So that's where they ended up. Okay, in, in, in this situation. So <laughs> they stayed in the main room. So I have here, it was an all-purpose room. 
a, a, a workplace, a store perhaps during the day, but at night a shelter for uh, animals, okay, and, and, and that sort of thing. So when you start reading the history of this, it, it begins to make sense, you know, that the life was much simpler than it, it is now, you know, as, as you see this. So, and she gave birth, verse 7, to her firstborn son. Now, what is he called in Matthew? Emmanuel, meaning what? God with us. Now, now think about this. Israel has been waiting for how many decades and centuries for their Messiah to come to free him? Lots of years, okay? You know, five, six hundred years. They, they, they've, been, they've been waiting for this, all right, to happen. And what, what, what would be the idea of a deliverer? coming. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a guy in a white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as, as people want to visualize physically, you know, in, in the book of Revelation. And somebody of means coming into a royal family, but yet where'd they come, where'd he come from? Dirt poor people. Okay? And he comes. No spiritual eyesight. And that's a problem today with the church. And still our Jewish friends are waiting for what? Their Messiah. Okay. Still waiting for their Messiah. So then it says this in verse 8. In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone round around them, and they were terribly frightened. Now, two things here. Number one, these flocks were probably the lambs and sheep that were being prepared for the feast day, for the total feast, okay? Number two is this. At nighttime, there were no older shepherds out there. They used to pay the younger people the teenage boys to go and watch at night, okay? Because the shepherds then would have to take them into Jerusalem or whatever it required more work, all right? So I thought, that, I thought that was very interesting. So it's young people here that are seeing the angel and they're frightened, okay? And you and I'd be frightened too. But the angel said to them in verse 10, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord, the Messiah, the Lord, all right? When you see Christ, put Messiah in there, and, and you'll, you'll see that. And so these young men here then were the first ones to find out that the Messiah had been born, all right, beside Joseph, okay? This will be a sign for you, verse 12. And you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. Now this is the angel choir, if you can imagine it. And on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. I love choir music. Uh, who is the group in uh, the Brooklyn Baptist Choir? Is it Baptist? Susan, Tabernacle, the Bro Brooklyn Tabernacle. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a conglomeration of people, of races that go to churches there, and, you know, it's huge. And the music is wonderful. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir, same thing. I mean, just beautiful. Here, they're hearing the angels from heaven singing. What, what a sound that must have made to them. You know, and, and, and the beauty of it. Then in verse 15, let me keep going here. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, uh, which the Lord hath made known to us. So the angels appeared to them, do the singing and the praising of God, but it's not in Bethlehem, it's outside. Somewhere between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, right? So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. 
They came in a what? If Dick and I were the, were the <laughs> shepherds, we would not have been there in a hurry. I'm going to tell you that. All right. That's why I say they were younger men. Okay. That, that were hired to do that. So they come. What's that, sir? Oh, <laughs> Dick would have caught the bus. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as, as, as you see that, okay? So when they had seen this in verse 17, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. Well, who are all? And, you know, we're not told who the other people are. And I wonder if it was the people from the upstairs rooms. When they found, oh, a baby was just born downstairs, you know? Could have been relatives. We don't know. All right. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. She did the same thing in verse 51 when the Lord is 12 years old, if you remember that. I must be about my father's business, my father's work, however you want to say that. Okay. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. Okay, had been told them. Now, uh, yeah, I have time to do this. <clears throat> Verse 21. Then, and when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Okay, and when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So verse 22, and when the days for their purification, who had to be purified? But it's there, it's plural. <laughs> so who else would have to be purified? Dick has a good guess, sir. Joseph, the baby doesn't have to be. I'll show you something about Jesus here in a minute. So Mary had to be uh, purified. There, there was a purification ritual. Uh, let's, let's do this here. Oh, I have it right in my Bible. Uh, come over to Leviticus chapter 12. Okay. Leviticus chapter 12, please. <clears throat> right after Exodus there, right? And chapter 12. Things we don't think about too much, right? Now, it's a short chapter, only eight verses, so let's, let's read them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, When a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days. As in the days of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day... The flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So we read that in Luke, right? That Jesus would be circumcised. Then she shall remain in the blood of her purification for 33 days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing, nor enter the sanctuary until the days of her purification are completed. So how many days is that? 33 plus what? Okay. How many is that? 41 days. Okay. Verse 5. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean for two weeks, as in her menstruation, and she shall remain in the blood of her purification for 66 days. When the days of her purification are completed, for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Okay, there's no temple then, right? A one-year-old lamb for burnt offering and a, a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, whether male or female. But if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be what? She'll be clean. So we see what's happening here. Now she had a male son, Jesus. He is circumcised on the eighth day. All right, the eighth day. But Mary 
for these 40 days is considered unclean, going through a purification, and she has to go, okay, in this case, it was a tent of meeting at the tabernacle, but Mary's right there close to the to temple, and so that's where she goes. And what does she offer? offer? Uh, keep your hand in Leviticus. What's that, Dick? Okay, uh, come on down to verse 24 uh, in, in Luke chapter 2. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was paid in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And that's what she offered. So what does this tell us? It's less expensive. They couldn't afford a lamb. Well, I thought that the three wise men came with gold in frankincense and myrrh. So it tells you something. They didn't show up right away. Yeah. So it's probably, some people, a, a year. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's called a young child. All right. So it's interesting when you see that. Okay, so when they go up for it. Now, what about Joseph, the, their, <laughs> their purification? Why would he have to be purified? Well, I wonder who helped Mary deliver the child. So he touched the blood, okay, helped clean the child and, and all that sort of thing. So come over to chapter 15 of Leviticus, all right? Chapter 15, and let's notice, uh, if you would... 15 and verse 19, where it says this. When a woman has a discharge, if her discharge in her body is blood, I have to turn the page here, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Okay? Okay. So the blood makes them unclean. That, that's, that's, what, that's what you see, all right, as, as you look at that. And that almost gives you the idea, when the Lord was on, went to the cross, and then he, he died, raised from the dead, what did Mary Magdalene and the women want to do? But what did he say? Until he got to the Father. I wonder, what did he take to the Father? The blood. Now, I believe he sprinkled it on the mercy seat up there, the purification happened, okay? And so when he comes back, which is pretty quick, all right, go ahead and touch me, Thomas. <laughs> you know, that, that sort of thing as, as, as you look at it. So as you read, and I can't go any further with this, we'll, we'll be catching Simeon here, uh, okay, uh, later on. Oh, I didn't do this with you. Uh, verse 23. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens a womb in Luke, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 23, every firstborn male that opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Uh, let's come back to Exodus chapter 2, or chapter uh, 13, please. Okay. Uh, what was the last plague, if you want to call it? that God did upon Egypt before he delivered a people. The firstborn, men and animals, all right? Now, here we are in chapter 13, and let's notice, uh, uh, what verses do I want? Uh, I think it's 2. Yeah, here we are, 2 and 12, verse 2. Sanctify to me every firstborn. The first, uh, the, fir the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast, it belongs to whom? It belongs to God. Okay? So Jesus belonged to God. Verse 12. You shall devote to the Lord the first spring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. So when they go up, as you come on back with me, okay, and the offering is made in, in Luke 2, there in verse 24, 
and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and uh, two young pigeons here. What we find basically is this, this offering was offered for the purification of Mary, for Joseph and to buy back from God their son. Okay, because who owned, who <laughs> Jesus belonged by law to God. Okay, and when you see San, uh, Hannah, Samuel's mother, what happened there? She didn't take him back. She gave him to the temple, to God, which, which is interesting here. So actually, that's how I perceive this, that, 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 that Jesus had to be ransomed back so that he could be uh, the child for Joseph and Mary. And remember this about those shepherds. Man, they were the first ones to hear. First ones to hear the gospel in the new covenant, okay? Which they had no idea what it meant, but that, that was it, see? Who knows what they learned later on in their life. So I'm going to close there.